All right. So chapter five, we left off. Um, what about page ninety? Does that sound familiar? Yep. Page ninety, page ninety-one. Remember this chapter, or hopefully you remember, I haven't had many days since Thursday. This chapter deals with transferring title, right? The whole first half of the chapter, we talked about what word? What four-letter word is this chapter all about? Deeds. Deeds are the important topic in this chapter. <laughs> they are... The name of the game, so to speak. Why? Because what do deeds do? Transfer title. They transfer a title. It's the name of the chapter, right? The chapter is all about moving property from one person, one entity to another, and that's what deeds do. Uh, deeds are an example in most cases, not always, but most cases, of what we call voluntary alienations. Voluntary alienations are things that we do voluntarily, on purpose. Right? We do it of our own free will. Things like a sale. We sell a property. That's a voluntary alienation. We did that on purpose. Tonight we're starting off with involuntary alienations. These are things that are against our will. Sometimes they're done by people like lenders. Sometimes they're done by government entities. Sometimes they're done by private entities. But these are things that are all examples of us losing title or having the title transferred out of our name against our will, without our permission. So the first one you've got up here on the slide is something called a sheet. And I focus on the last five letters here because it's the best description of it. What are the last five letters there? G. G. This is when the state decides that um, you don't need this property anymore, so we just have it for ourselves. And actually what's happened here is you've passed away. You've passed away without a will. Now when you we call that dying intestate. I want you to put that word in your notes so that you have it in case you see it in a test. And you don't freak out when you see it. If you die testate, that's with the will. If you die in testate, that's without a will. What do we call a will? The last will and what? Testament. The testament. That's how you remember that. A will is a last will and testament. So if you die with one of those, you have a testament, right? So you're testate. If you die and you don't have one of those, you are intestate, without testament. Make sense? Now, if you die intestate, I'm going to use the fancy word from now on, so hopefully it'll sink in. That way you can see it on a test, you don't freak out. If you die intestate, so I'm dying what? Without, Without a will, the state's going to make one for you. Every state has a law, what they call intestate succession. What, that's a very fancy way of saying the state makes a will for you. So if somebody dies without a will, what's the state going to probably do with their property? Give it to who? Well, who are their heirs, though? They don't have a will. Kids. Second, spouse would be first, right? And that's exactly what the law of intestate succession does. It sets up that order. Spouse first. Don't have a spouse? Kids. Don't have kids? Mom and daddy. Don't have those? Brother, Brother and sister. Don't have those? Cousins. Nieces and nephews. Then cousins. Once you get past first cousin... If the state can't find any living relatives, you know what they do? They, they keep it. And that's called a sheet. S cheat. That's my pronouncement. That's how I remember it. Okay? And you can imagine they look real hard, right? 
they do a real good job of looking. The second one up here on the board is eminent domain. This is the legal right of a government entity to take your property without your permission. So the government is taking your property. Now remember, when we talked about easements back in chapter 3, we said you could condemn an easement, right? You could take an easement for the public good. Like I gave the example of if I live out in the country, but Raleigh comes along and annexes my neighborhood into the city of Raleigh, they're going to run water and sewer to my property, and the way they're going to do it is they're going to condemn or take an easement to put that sewer line down, right? Now, what's an easement? Give me a definition of an easement. We're backing up to chapter 3, but somebody define what an easement is. You should be able to fire that off right now. What is an easement? The, perfect. Leslie said it's the right to use or access or be on somebody else's property, right? So if I'm condemning an easement, what am I doing? I'm taking the right to do what? To be on someone else's property. Well, this is taking condemnation to the next level. We're not taking the right to be on their property. What are we taking? The, whole property. the property itself. We're actually taking ownership of the property with this thing. We're not taking the right to be there. We're taking the whole thing. So that the government, the public, is going to own the property. So give me an example of when this might happen. Interesting. Highways. Highways, roads are a very common example of the process of eminent domain and the taking of property. When they build roads, folks, that land has to come from somewhere. And that land is going to be owned by somebody, right? And that somebody is not always in agreement with having 540 go through a piece of their farm or their backyard or their front yard or their house, right? So if the state had to wait for everybody in that potential roadway to actually agree to sell that land, it would be very hard to ever get a road built. Guess what? They don't have to wait. You know what they do? They condemn it and they take it. And in North Carolina, we are, this is not an exam, but you should know it, we are what's called a quick take state. That means that you do not have the legal authority to fight their right to take your property. There is no fighting it. There's no going to court. There's no saying this plant farm's been in my family for 200 years and it's sentimental. They don't care. You take it. Now, what do you think they have to do in exchange for taking it? Okay. They have to pay you. They have to pay you. State law says that they have to comp they have to compensate you for the loss in value of your property. Now what I will tell you about this process is you are a fool if you accept their first offer. Because that first offer will very rarely compensate you for what they've actually taken. I'll give you an example of that. About five or six years ago in Cary they widened Maynard Avenue, Maynard Road. How many of you are familiar with that road widening project in Cary? Maynard Road is one of the main roads that goes through the middle of Cary. It's in an old part of Cary, so a lot of the homes are very established along Maynard Road. And the, uh, the road went from three lanes, two in each direction with a turn lane, to five. So they were essentially widening it by a lane in each direction. Well, guess where those two lanes came from? People's front yards. Now, the lots were not small where those houses were, but when you lose 20 feet of your front yard, do they get a lot smaller? You get a lot closer to traffic and a lot more traffic, right? So what they did was they took and said, okay, well, we're taking 20% of your land. So your lot without your house is worth $60,000. We'll give you 20% of $60,000 as compensation. Now, if you own one of those houses, did your house decline in value by much more than you know, what is that, 12 grand? Did your house drop in value by 12 grand or did it drop in value by 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 dollars? Which one is it? The big number, right? 
in some cases even more than that. And so many of those people had to go fight. And I said, you didn't have the right to fight. You don't have the right to fight the taking, but what do you have the right to fight? How much they pay. You have the legal right to fight how much they pay you. You can't stop them from taking the land, but you can go and fight the compensation that you've been offered. And it has become a lot easier in recent years to fight the compensation. It used to be that you had the legal right to fight the compensation, but you weren't entitled to any of the money until that case was settled, which meant you had to pay all your own court costs, your attorney's fees while you were fighting. So most people couldn't afford to fight. Now, what you're allowed to do is take what they're offering you initially and use it toward your attorney's fees to fight for the additional funds. So many more people are successful now in fighting the amount of compensation that they've been given. Right? Does everybody understand this process of eminent domain and what it is? Okay? Remember, we use this word condemnation. Eminent domain is the taking of the property. Condemnation is the process of taking it. Does that make sense? So when we condemn a property, we're taking it. Gina, do you mind uh, pulling that door closed just so the vacuum cleaner is not so loud? Thank you. Sorry. All right. Are we good here? This is also one of the few times, in fact, it's the only time that I'm aware of now since we've got laws that protect tenants in foreclosure where the lease doesn't go with the transfer. Any other transfer of real property in North Carolina, if there's a lease on the property, the lease goes with the transfer. The tenant is protected in that transfer. So if you sell a house, does the new owner have to honor the lease? Mm -hmm. Yes. If a bank forecloses on a house, does the bank have to honor the lease? Yes. In eminent domain, if, house is, if the property is foreclosed, does the state or the county or the city have to honor that lease? No. 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 The only time that, does, that happens. Conveniently, they have exempted themselves from that requirement. Okay? Foreclosure is another example of an involuntary alienation, and we've talked about that one a lot. Um, it's on page 92 in your book. We've mentioned it a lot to this point. Um, we talked about the order in which debts would be paid. We'll talk about those again when we go through the finance chapters. But that is a form of involuntary alienation. So what kind of liens can be foreclosed? Specific liens or general liens? Specific, specific. specific liens. Now give me some examples of specific liens. Um, Mortgage, special, special assessments, property taxes, mechanics. mechanics liens. Those are all examples of specific liens that we have talked about. And that would be a lien foreclosure. Okay? Involuntary alienation, done against my will. This one, this next one, start. You're going to see it on a state exam. You're going to see it on the class exam. You're going to most likely get it wrong before I tell you how not to get it wrong, right? This is one of those things that they love to test you on. Something called adverse possession. Now when you hear about this, you're going to think it's the coolest, freakiest thing you never knew about in the world. This is a way for you to do something illegally for so long that we reward you by giving you somebody else's property. Diane said correctly, 20 years. There's a word for that 20 year time period. Remember in easements I said prescriptionary period? Do you remember that when I said the prescription period? Whenever you hear that phrase, it always means how long? 20 years. And so what adverse possession is, is your right to claim as yours a piece of property that you have illegally used as yours for how long? 20 years. But we've got to define what illegally using it means. If you're going to go make this claim of adverse, adverse possession, in other words, you're going to go to court and you're going to claim that I'm going to claim that Dusty's property that he owns legally is mine. And a judge is going to agree with me 
and going to grant me title to his property without me paying him a dime. So I've got to prove some things if I want that to happen. Would you agree with that? If you just walk in court and say, I want, you know, I'm, just, I'm claiming Jeff's property, they're going to laugh you out of court. You've got to prove some very specific things here to make this case for adverse possession. And we use this little mnemonic device of OCEAN to help you remember the things that must be present for it to be adverse possession. Okay? And all of these must be present. They will give you on a test a two, three paragraph description of a situation where somebody's trying to claim adverse possession. And you have to be very careful when you read that description that all of these five things are present in that situation. Okay? First, number one, the illegal use has to be open. What we mean by that is we're not trying to hide it. I'm using Dusty's property, but I'm using it like it's mine. As a matter of fact, if you ask most people around whose property that was, what's the answer you probably get? It's Travis's property. Hell, it must be. I see him out there all the time cutting the grass and trimming the trees and doing all kinds. It must be his property, right? That's what open means. It must be wide open. I am not squatting in some house at night with blackout curtains over the windows so nobody sees any light peeking out. I am using this property, whether it be house or land or whatever, just like it's mine. That's number one. Open. In the open. Number two, it has to be continuous. So what are you looking for as like sort of alarm things in a test taking situation if I say it has to be continuous? What are they going to say to you to throw you up, throw you off? He took, he took a break from using the property. He took a break from using the property. He's used it on and off for the last 20 years. Is on and off continuous? No. 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 Intermittently. Those kinds of words should be like alarm triggers for you. This is not continuous. So it has to be open. It has to be continuous. For how long? At least 20 years. And by the way, you probably need some proof that you've been doing it for at least 20 years, right? Okay. It has to be exclusive. If you're in an exclusive relationship, how many people are you dating? One. One. So how many people can be using this property illegally? One. One. If we've got a pond on a farm somewhere, and it is the party place, every weekend, 50 people go down there and fish and swim and do God knows what else in this pond, can anybody claim adverse possession on that thing? No, because essentially the use is just open to the public at that point in time, right? It needs to be an exclusive use that the person who's claiming adverse possession, the person taking or trying to take the property, is the only one who's been using it like this illegally. You with me so far? So we're three of the five now. It has to be actual and that, has, that means that it's not... Basically, in your book, they describe that um, as with against the owner's permission, which is sort of the same thing as notorious. I grouped those last two together. Actual notorious means it has to be against the best interest of the owner. In other words, it's bad for the owner for you to use the property in this way. You're not helping them out. And the last part of notorious means without their permission without their permission. So if you're the owner of the property, how could you, say you found out somebody's been using your property for the last 18, 19 years, and you didn't know anything about it. How could you prevent a claim for, for adverse possession? They tell them they go stop. They tell them, well, you can tell them stop, or you can tell them what? Hey, it's all right. You it's all right. You can use it. You don't need to have to pay me. You don't have to pay me, it's fine. Go right on. It looks good. Keep doing what you're doing. That permission cancels any claim of adverse possession. So you have to have done it for 20 years without their permission. Does that make sense? 
So if you've done it for 20, for 18 years without a permission and they show up one day and say, you know what, I wish you had told me ahead of time, but I'm all right with it. You can go ahead and use it. Is that adverse possession? No. 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 It has to be all of these things if they're going to claim adverse possession. So make sure that. Yes, ma'am, So if it's farmland, like let's say it's some land and you're planting, gardening yep. or whatever on yep. it, and you garden on it, but you don't garden like in December because it's cold. So, I mean, but you garden every year yep. for all the time you can. That'd be an interesting one. That'd be an interesting one. I will say we had a case of adverse possession that I'm aware of in Johnston County, and it dealt with a, uh, a person whose property backed up to like a, um, how, what do they call those things? Not, uh, not Shriners, but what's the other one? Uh, a Ruritan. Y'all familiar with Ruritan clubs? It's like clubs out in the country. You know, and they're private clubs, it's private property. But I guess they own some property and it backed up to a couple of houses. And one of the people in the houses had actually fenced off about a quarter of an acre that belonged to the Ruritan Club and, and gardened it. Far, you know, they had created their garden back there, but they had actually fenced it off. Yeah, they fence. And, and and because they you know, they they put fences up, I guess, to keep deer out or keep whatever, you know, because they just fenced in the garden park. But they made a claim for adverse possession because it had been so long that they have been doing this thing, and they made a claim for adverse possession. And and they got it. They were granted title to the property. And and basically what the judge said was, well, you all are having meetings here once a week. At no point over the last 20-some years did somebody bother to walk over there and say, hey, why didn't you put a fence up on our property? Here's what this idea is rooted in. You're supposed to maintain your property. You are legally required to maintain your property in North Carolina. And if you've got uses that are against your permission going on for more than 20 years, the state just sort of says you've got no business owning it in the first place. We may as well give it to somebody else. At least maybe they know what's going on there. Does that make sense? So is everybody okay on this adverse possession thing? If you get a test question on it, make sure that you look at it carefully. Okay, now I'm going to give you one more. I have heard on the state exam, occasionally they will throw questions at you about, well, what if the owner was shut in their home and couldn't know? They could not know. You know? They don't know. And in general, that means it's not open enough. So you probably would not win a claim for adverse possession because it's not open enough at that point in time. If they're actually there and they still don't know, at some point somebody should have said something to them. You know, just some other person. Okay. Well, I guess that's true. Like if it's an old person who's in a nursing home for right. a really long time, and you yeah. just like kind of taking the end of it. Yes, correct. Yeah. In general, they won't let you make that kind of a claim for adverse possession. Okay. All right. Also, invol considered involuntary is transfer of title by a deceased person. All right. Um, if that happens by descent, that means somebody has died without a will. That's intestate succession. If it happens with a will, that's called devise by devise. All right, on the bottom of page 93, we get into title issues and title assurance. Remember, I told you when we got to deeds, that word title, it means ownership. Right? We use that as like a big, broad term that represents ownership. So transferring title is transferring ownership. When we do transfer a title, we, we want to transfer what's called a marketable title or a clear and marketable title. What do you think that means? If I'm transferring ownership of a piece of property to somebody and I say I, I want them to transfer me marketable title, what do you think that means? The general warranty? 
Well, I could get marketable. I mean, that's a good that's a good stab at it. But I could get marketable title with a quit claim deed just as well as I could a general warranty deed. I'm sorry. Something I can sell. Yeah, that's what it has to do with. All right. So tell me, if somebody's buying something from me, don't they want to make pretty sure that I actually own the thing? Mm -hmm. So how do they make sure I actually own the thing? Leslie said, "Check the records." Isaiah said, "Do what?" Um, I was going to say something. Make sure, like, their name is on the record and they have a clear distinction of who owns the property. Make sure they're first of all. Make sure their names on the thing, right? Well, are we going to stop there? Are we going to just look and make sure their names on the thing? We're going to check to see who else had it in the past and how. So the first person we check is the person that had it right before this person, right? Mm -hmm. See how this person got it, who they got it from, and then what do you think we do? We look at the person before that. And then what's next? The person before that. And that's what we do. We keep going further and further back. And here's what we're looking for every time. That the people's names match each time we go further back. Right? If I'm looking at who owns it right now, I'm going to look at their deed. All right. Now, on their deed, are they going to be the grantee or the grantor? Grantee. Grantee, because that's how they got the property, right? We look on their deed, and they are the grantee. Well, who's this grantor person that's listed on there? The person they bought it from. The person they bought it from, right? Mm -hmm. So now, let's go pull up that grantor's deed, right? We're going to go one further back. We're going to pull up the deed that that grantor had. Now, that person, are they the grantee or grantor now? They're the grantee. Who's listed on the other side of the deed? The grantor. So that was the person they bought the property from, right? So now what can we do? We can pull up that grantor's deed. Now they're the grantee, right? Except, uh oh, when I get three back, I notice that the grantee is three people. But the deed I just looked at, where they were the grantor, has two signatures on it. So what is that telling me? It's telling me that the, when they were grantees, there were how many of them? Three. So when they sold, there should have been how many of them? Three. Three. But there's how many? Three. Two. Is that a problem? Yes. Does that problem make it really hard to do that thing that, le that, that Jesse mentioned? Which was what? Sell, Sell the property. So do we still have marketable title? No. no. We just lost marketable title. We call that a defect in the title or a cloud on the title. What that means is that the person who's trying to sell it right now may or may not own the thing. And even if they do own it, they may or may not own all of it, right? Because if only two of those grantees that became grantors signed, only how much of the property got transferred? Those two, -thirds. two thirds, right? <laughs> Maybe, and that's what we have to find out. So, and they said the same thing, right? Somebody could have died. Could have. We better find out. And that's what a title search is all about. When you go back, you're looking for names that match. It's great to do a title search where grant, you go back every single time and the grantee on this one is the grantor on the previous one. Or the next one, sorry. All the way around. You're, you're a grantee first and you're a grantor, right? So we look at our deed. The grantor is the grantee on the previous. And the same thing. The grantor is the grantee on the previous. And the names match. Boom, 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 boom. Names match. If we go back and we go back and we go back and they all match, we got good, clear, marketable title. But when we run across one like that, where it's three people and then it's all of a sudden two, got a problem. What if we go back, and so here's making the title search more complicated. I go back two or three deeds and we've got two grantees. And then we go back and we look, but both of those grantees were married. How many signatures should we be seeing? Four. Four signatures, right? Instead of two. If they're both married, don't their spouses have some interest in that property? Right? 
So suppose we don't see the spouse's signatures. Do we have marketable title? We just lost marketable title. That's what this idea of a marketable title really is. It's going back and we're looking for a clean, it's like doing a background check, right? And we're looking for it to come up clean. Now that doesn't mean we, just like you all, are going to have a background check when you go apply to the Real Estate Commission for a license. Now, if something comes up on your background check, does that mean you automatically can't get a license? No. no. It just means we've got to apply, or they do, have to apply greater scrutiny to you, right? They may have to do some research. You may have to explain some things. You may have to go sit down at a character conference with them. Title searches work the same way. If they go back and everything's perfectly clean, the thing takes 15 minutes and we're done. But as soon as they hit a snag, now it's time to do some work. Right? We've got to research. We've got to figure out what happened to that third grantee. Did they die? Well, if they died, that's great. There's only two. But wait a minute. That's only true if they left their share to what? The other two. What if they died and they left their share to their children? What if they died and they didn't have a will? Right? Let me just ask you this question. Is it possible? I know family would not do this to one another. Never. Is it possible, though, that mom and daddy die and they leave the farm to two brothers and a sister, three siblings, right? And one of those siblings passes away, and her children are too young to know anything about this farm. And brothers never bother to tell children when they get older that, hey, you actually own part of this farm. And then you just go sell the thing. Is that, that The family would never do that to one another, would they? Of course they would. <laughs> They're the first ones that would do it. Absolutely. You don't believe it. Wait till you get involved in real estate. I had an agent just last week who called me and she said, I got a problem. I said, what, what do you mean? And she said, well... I listed a house in Wilson. I said, is that the problem? She said, no, but it's bad enough. Um, and, <laughs> and she said that she had a buyer for it. And I said, sounds good to me. I don't see what the problem is so far. She said, well, here's the problem. The property was inherited by four brothers. Their mother passed away, and the four of them inherited it. I said, okay, well, you, I said, you got a listing agreement with all four of them. She said, I think so. So what do you mean you think so? She said, well, three of them still live in Wilson. And the other one lives in California. I said, okay. She said, well, I met with the three that live in Wilson in the office. I said, well, when did you meet with the one in California? She said, well, I never have. I said, well, have you emailed with them? She said, well, what I did was gave them the listing and said, I need you to get your brother's signature on this thing. No. And I said, well, you might have a problem. I said, what leads you at this point to suspect you have a problem? So here's what brought us to this point where she suspects she has a problem. It's time to close. Now, time to close means time to sign a deed, right? Well, three brothers and little Wilson, no problem. They have signed a deed. When you sign a deed, what else are you going to have done with that signature? Notarize. Because somebody's going to be recording this thing, right? So now these other three brothers are saying, oh, we can't get in touch with our other brother, blah, blah, blah. What it boils down to is they forged his signature on this listing agreement. Now they're having a hard time figuring out how they're going to get a notarized signature on this deed, right? And she said, she said, what do you think I should do? I said, you got a problem. <laughs> I don't really know what to tell you to do at this point other than just be honest with the listing of the agent on the other side of the transaction and say, I suspect I have been guilty of some fraud here. Let everybody know what's going on. Sick the buyer's attorney on them. That's all you can do at that point. But you see what I mean about in those situations, these things happen, right? And so this is the purpose of title searches, to turn up stuff like that. And inevitably, there are going to be times when you turn up stuff. Now, uh, we want to make sure that the title is free of significant liens and encumbrances, has no serious defects, no questions of law, um, has the promise of quiet enjoyment, and be reasonably assured that somebody's paying fair market value for the thing. Don't memorize those five things, but understand the concept behind 
marketable titles. Everybody got that concept down, what we're really looking for. We're looking for that clean transfer of title from one owner to another. And on page 96, what do we call that thing, that clean transfer? What do you call it? The chain of title. That's what we call, when we go back and you research, that's what we're looking at when we're doing a title search. We are looking at the chain of title. We want to make sure we've got this transfer from owner to owner to owner and that all of them are included in the transfers. Now, when we do a title search, and I say when we do a title search, who's going to actually do a title search? You're going to hire somebody. That somebody's going to be a closing attorney. Who did we say the closing attorney represents in the transaction? The buyer or the seller? The buyer. the buyer. Remember, it's the buyer who stands to lose in this thing, right? It's the buyer who's breaking out the money. It's the buyer who's taking all the risk. I mean, what risk is the seller taking? None. The worst they can do is end up with the same thing they had before they started, which is the property, right? That's the worst they could do. So all the risk is the buyer, because the buyer could end up paying a bunch of money and get something that's not worth anything if they aren't careful, right? So we're going to hire a closing attorney to do this title search. Now they go back and they look at that chain of title, but we don't want to see, chain of title is pages and pages and pages and pages. I mean, they may have to go back 20 deeds. We don't want to see all that. Now, m many of you may not be old enough to remember what the heck this is, but for those of you that are old enough, you remember Cliff's Notes? Mm -hmm. How many of you remember Cliff's Notes or have ever mm -hmm. seen Cliff's Notes, right? Cliff's Notes were like the short and sweet version of something that you didn't want to spend the whole time reading, right? Like, go read Macbeth, or here's 30 pages that'll tell you exactly what's in there. Mm -hmm. That's Cliff's Notes. Well, we have a Cliff's Notes version of the chain of title. It's called an abstract of title. An abstract of title is like a little one page overview of how many times the property has been transferred and whether or not that was a clear transfer. That's what the closing attorney is going to provide. They're going to provide this abstract of title, which is the short and sweet version of the chain of title. Now, to this point, I haven't put any boundaries on how far back this title search has to go. You could, in theory, go crazy with this thing, right? You'd be back looking at land records in the 1600s. Good luck finding all those records. Yes, ma'am. Is it digital? Back to a certain extent. In Wake County, for example, records are digital back in 1930. You want to see anything older than 1930? You know where you go? You go to the archives at the county courthouse. And they take you down into a cellar. And I mean a cellar. And they give you the actual books. <laughs> and you have to be real careful. Because those pages are really, really in rough shape. If you want to see anything older than that, that's what you have to do. You have to actually dive down there and look at the physical books. Because they haven't been digitized. Now, that could get real tedious, right? Can you imagine paying an attorney $200 an hour to go look through all those books if you were buying a $100,000 house? So how do we fix that? How do we know where to stop? Do they just get to a good guessing point and they say, ah, that's far enough. We look far enough. We're not looking any further. Do, the, do they give the client a price sheet that says, you can have us go back 50 years. You can have us go back 100 years. You, have to, you pick. How do we handle this thing? We've got to be upset. There's got to be a set amount. Somebody, Jesse, said 30 years. Folks, welcome to the North Carolina Marketable Title Act. The state legislature has fixed this problem for us. And what they've essentially said is that any claim older than 30 years is invalid. What are we looking for when we go back and do a title search? Back but I mean, what are we looking for? Defects, right? And a defect would be what? A claim, right? A, a somebody else having a claim on this property. So if we've essentially said that if you get past this point, the claims aren't 
valid anymore, do we have any reason to look further than that? No. No, because they're useless. They're useless. So the, what the North Carolina Marketable Title Act does, it says any claim older than 30 years is extinguished. It's gone. So right now, how far back is your title, to what year are your title searches going back right now? 1985. 1985. When you do a title search right now, your attorney is going back to 1985. If they find good, clear transfer of title since 1985, you've got marketable title. How often do these titles come up? How often do they come up? Depends on where the property is located. If it's in a rural area, all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. Especially um, rural areas where people die that don't have wills and they have big families. You know, you get lots of problems. I mean, imagine somebody that has eight or ten children who are all adults and married and have four, five, six children of their own. And they pass away. Grandma dies. And doesn't have a will. So this thing gets split 26 different ways. Right? And now we're going to sell it. Trying to get all those names on the deed. And making sure you got all those names on the deed. They, the title issues come up in situations like that, for sure. Which is why we try to put a lid on it with this 30-year thing. You know, So basically the idea here is you got 30 years to catch it if you've got some claim against the property. If you don't catch it in 30 years, it doesn't matter. You could open up the safe. You, if, let's say I went in my late grandfather's house tonight and I opened up his safe and I found a deed to Umstead State Park that was his. The whole damn thing was his. If it was more than 30 years old, would it, be, it wouldn't be worth the paper it was written on. Even if it was, I could prove it was 100% valid and I 100% should own that land, it wouldn't matter because it's older than 30 years. That, does everybody follow that? So any claims more than 30 years are extinguished. Alright? So, why do we record titles? Well, the reason we record titles is so that we can give public notice of our ownership. Remember that if we don't record the title, we run the risk of somebody else doing what? The Claiming the property. Recording a title with their name on it. Because as long as somebody else is listed as the owner of public record, that somebody else can sign a deed transferring the property over. Right? We can hold on that deed if we want to. We don't have to record it. But don't be surprised if you one day show up and somebody else is in the property because they've recorded a deed adverse to yours. So it's in your best interest to do what? Record it. Record it. It's in your best interest to record it. Absolutely. Now, you need to learn this law. The Connor Act. And in your book, it's on uh, the, the page 100. <coughs> page 100, the Connor Act. We talked about another law on Thursday night called the Statute of Frauds. Tell me about that law. It must be in writing. What must be in writing? The law itself? No, the, the, uh, the contract, the deed. Deed is one thing. Is it the only thing that the Statute of Frauds covers? No, leases uh, more than three years. Leases of more than three years are on there. What else is on there? You don't have to know the whole list, but what I'm getting at is it's a law that says certain documents, and there's a bunch of them, have to be what? In writing. In writing for what to happen? For the sun to come up every day? No. Not for transfer of title. In writing for what? In order to be enforceable where? Out on the street? In a court of law. Now you got it. So tell me the whole thing. The statute of fraud says what? Certain documents must be. In order to be what? Enforceable where? In a court of law. Certain documents must be in writing in order to be enforceable in a court of law. That is the statute of frauds. Okay? Now, the Connor Act also has to do with documents being enforceable in a court of law. It's not going to be in writing because that's already covered under the statute of frauds, right? What does the Connor Act require? That certain documents be what? Recorded, Recorded in order to be enforceable. enforceable in a court of law. So the statute of fraud says certain documents, like, for example, sales contracts for real property, right? 
have to be in writing in order to be enforceable in a court of law. The Connor Act says documents that are on this list must be recorded in order to be enforceable in a court of law. And deeds are on that list. Deeds are on that list. All right, let's talk for a second about title insurance. Now, remember the whole discussion about the different kinds of deeds we had last week? Who remembers that? Be honest. Remember that? Three main categories of deeds, right? What's the best kind of deed you can get? General, General warranty. warranty deed. What's the next one down? Special. Special warranty or limited warranty, same thing. And what's the bottom rung deed? Quit claim. Quit claim. Which one works better at transferring title? All of them are exactly the same. They all transfer title exactly the same. They just come with what? Different guarantees. Different guarantees, right? Why is the general warranty deed considered better? Because it has more, more guarantees. Quick claim deed has how many guarantees? Zero. Right? Remember that whole discussion about the different types of deeds? Remember I said that that's kind of useless in today's world, right? Because who's making those guarantees? The seller. So here's what you're essentially saying. Isaiah, you're selling me your house, right? And you're giving me a general warranty deed. So you're guaranteeing that there are no encumbrances against the property other than what's listed on the deed. You're guaranteeing that you own it and you have the right to sell it. You're guaranteeing I have the right to quiet enjoyment. And how long is he guaranteeing all those things for? Forever. Forever, right? So 40 years later, somebody shows up at my front door screaming about they own the property, right? So I've got a general warranty deed. Who can I call to come in and defend my claim, my title? Call Isaiah, right? Because I'm sure going to have his phone number to find him. 40 years later, right? But that's what we're saying with this general warranty deed nonsense. We're saying that Isaiah agrees to come back in and defend my title. Is that practical? No. It's not. So, some enterprising people who wanted to make money I said, you know what? This ain't real practical. But we can sell you something that will make you feel a lot better about it. What do they sell you? Insurance. insurance. They sell you insurance. So who am I really going to call 40 years later when somebody shows up at my door screaming about they own my house? I'm going to call my title insurance company. And they're going to defend my claim. Right? Now, why would they agree to do that? They don't know if he's telling the truth or not. It's a bet, folks. They're making a bet. How often do you think they actually pay title claims? No. Very, very, very rarely. It is cheap. They don't want to know if it's cheap. And it is cheap. You know how long title insurance lasts? Forever. As long as you own the property. You buy it one time, you're done. As long as you own the property. A couple hundred thousand dollar house can cost you a couple hundred dollars. That's pretty cheap. Wouldn't you say? For something that lasts forever. But here's the thing. I used to could use this example, but we changed the way we buy health insurance. Let me use life insurance example. How many of you have ever bought life insurance? Okay. For most life insurance, not the guaranteed issue stuff, but most life insurance, you fill out the application, what's the first thing they do? Send you where? To the doctor. We'll make sure you're not dying right now, right? They send you to the doctor because they trust the doctor's opinion about your health, right? Whose opinion do you think the title insurance company is going to rely on that they're not putting an insurance policy on a bad title? The attorney. We call that the opinion of title. When you hear that phrase, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the, the closing attorney has done the title search, and in their opinion, we've got good, clear, marketable title. 
They pick up the phone and they call the title insurance company and they say, look, we've done the research. We've gone back 30 years. We don't see any problems with the title. And guess what? We get issued a title insurance policy. Does that make sense? So does it matter to you that you get a general warranty deed or a special warranty deed or a quit claim deed as a buyer? It does? No. Because you're going to get insurance on it. Now, what might it affect? If you're sick, does your insurance cost the same thing you get life insurance? Or does it cost what? A little bit more. So if you get a quick claim deed, you can expect your title insurance to be what? A little bit more expensive. But from your perspective, as, as far as worrying about do you have good clear title, should you be worried if you get a quick claim deed or a special warranty deed? No. As long as you get what? Title insurance. Title insurance. And guess what? If you get a loan, guess what you don't have a choice about getting? Title insurance. You, you borrow somebody's money in hundreds of thousands of dollars, they put a whole lot of rules in place about what you will have and what you will buy. And title insurance is number one on that list. Because we want to make sure you got good, clear, marketable title. Does that make sense? Does everybody sort of follow that? Okay, that's how today's system works. We don't rely on these guarantees and the deeds anymore. We rely on the title insurance. That's its purpose. All right? And I said it lasts forever. It's not really true. Every time you refinance, they're going to make you buy a new title insurance policy. It Technically, your old one is still good, but your lender to feel safe is going to make you buy a new one. So technically, you have to get a new one every time you refinance. But if, you, if, if the lender didn't require it, your old one would be good. You usually get it cheaper because you can get what they call a reissue rate. But um, you will have to get another one. Any questions about title insurance and marketable title? Good? All right, let's take a break then.